This video made possible by the Global Innovation Exchange. Visit gixnetwork.org to learn more. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm David Samuelson, and uh, I'm delighted to be here this morning with my friend Jesse. Um, I have spent uh, a good long time in the ed tech industry before I uh, joined uh, Greater Good recently, a social impact e-commerce and publishing company here in Seattle. Um, and I have spent a lot of time with technology and education, uh, starting as early as the Oregon Trail, which was early gaming in classrooms, as most of you know. Um, Jesse, uh, is, I'd like to ask, start by asking you to maybe introduce yourself a little bit more and talk about how a Harvard Business School uh, grad who started in the banking industry ended up as such a distinguished leader in the education industry. Well, thanks and good morning, everyone. Um, thrilled to be here. I, uh, I started my career in banking in New York City, and as part of a volunteer effort, I used to I remember taking the A train up to Harlem to tutor kids. It was just part of our family tradition. Um, my father came here as an immigrant, really equipped with his education. And one of the things that I took away from these brilliant kids who just happened to be impoverished in Harlem was that the only thing that was different between me and them was that I had amazing parenting and I had access to a great education. I actually thought they were more innovative and, and scrappier than I ever could be. And I thought that we needed to do better. So I stepped off. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and where did you start then? You uh, stepped off to do what? I, uh, I started at Kaplan. And Kaplan was, it was at a time, most people have taken an LSAT or GMAT, I, I assume, out there. And at the time I did it, it was paper and pencil, and I went to Kaplan at a time that they were digitizing their tests. And that was when it occurred to me, if we can figure out a way to use technology to, to um, make access broader and to make things more efficient and cheaper, people that couldn't afford, uh, at the time, $800 tests were buying Barron's books. I'm dating myself for like 30 bucks. But what if we could use technology to create an $800 opportunity that was cheaper? So I, I thought there was an appropriate place for technology and learning to democratize learning opportunity. Well, some of you may uh, not know the education technology industry, uh, but I know you know Apple. And Apple's <laughs> name itself was really because it thought, I think Steve Jobs was a big fan of technology and education. And even to this day, teachers have a big affinity to Apple for that reason. And the early um, technology was you know, machines in classrooms. And Mac, the Oregon Trail, was a big pioneer in getting technology into classrooms. But I'm curious to know from you, what are your views on how technology can or should be powering teaching and learning? I think we just have to keep this simple. The thing that keeps me up at night is, what if our best isn't good enough? What if our best schools, with our best educators, with the best resources for kids, isn't enough for kids to compete globally in an information-driven economy? I think that's what weighed on the founders of Dreambox Learning in 2006 when it was formed. We figured, they figured, I wasn't even a part of it then, they figured that if we could personalize learning in a way to promote student agency, in a way to inspire kids to learn, to love to learn, then it kind of wouldn't matter what a kindergartner faced 20 years from now because we weren't gonna to try to guess what technologies and what skills and what capabilities a kindergarten needed 20 years from now because we would develop agency in learning we would develop confidence and competence in learning so that whatever they face 20 years from now, they could remake, literally, remake their skill set with confidence. I think at the beginning when you and I started in this, in this field, success in ed tech was one-to-one. -one. How do we get more devices in front of kids? Because that'll solve everything. We're going to revolutionize learning because we're going to give every kid a desktop at that time. Not even laptop, desktop. And we realized that technology that remained on the periphery of learning was not going to move the mark. I am so excited about what's happening in learning technologies now because the technologies that are driven now are technologies that literally impact learning 
at the point of instruction. The impact learning at the point of instruction. So many of, many of the folks in this room probably already use technologies that get to know them better the more we use them. Netflix, Amazon, right? They, they get to know us the more we use that. Well, imagine if we could bring that into learning. That's what we've done at Dreambox. We've created a technology that literally learns the learner as the learner learns, dynamically, continuously. So what does that mean? It means that we can personalize not only the pace and the place of learning, which a lot of ed tech companies do, but at Dreambox, we actually personalize the pedagogy itself. We look at how kids are thinking, how they're formulating hypotheses. We understand why they're failing. So if a child is failing in fractions, is it because they don't understand measurement, proportionality? Like, what is the underlying skill that's making them fail in fractions? So if you give a child a video and you say, I'm gonna introduce you to fractions, and they don't get it right, then we say, watch the video again. Okay, so they watch it again, and they don't get it right again. We say, watch the video again. Kids are smart. That's Sisyphusian. But if we were to give actionable insights to both the learner and the learning guardian, so that the learning guardian knew why the child was struggling with fractions, and therefore what the learning guardian should do to get that child unstuck, then we can actually do something that's personalized, that's relevant, and that prevents a child from getting frustrated. How many people know kids who by the third grade think they're good in reading or good in math? How many? I mean, like, that's crazy, right? They're in third grade. <laughs> we can all get better. So we try to say to kids, you're not good at math yet. Yet. Mm -hmm. It's an important three-letter word, yeah. yet. Um, classrooms haven't changed a lot in 150 years. If you go to an ed tech conference like this, you'll always see a slide of an old classroom next to a new classroom and trying to make comparisons. Um, but technology accelerates very quickly, and it, it has in our lives. We didn't know we needed a phone and a, a, a camera and a voice recorder and a calendar in our pockets, but we do all need them now. How do you think um, the next 10 years are gonna look in education technology? I think we're going to start to distinguish between ed tech and learning technologies. So we can automate a grade book, we can deliver LMSs, all important parts of the landscape of learning, but what's actually happening between the learner and the learning guardian? Mm -hmm. What's ha actually happening in the learning process mm -hmm. to support great teaching and learning? Mm -hmm. I think in, in V1 of EdTech, mm -hmm. it was about efficiency, and it was about access, broadband and device access. Mm -hmm. I think in V2 or Chapter 2 of EdTech, it was about what we call personalization. Uh, but that could have just meant, you know, picking your avatar, or picking your background, or I mean, it's still personalization. Mm -hmm. I think the future, or chapter three in uh, ed tech, really, is going to be around learning technologies. Mm -hmm. What are kids learning? Where are they stuck? And most importantly, what do we need to do as learning guardians, parents, tutors, teachers, administrators, to get them unstuck? And I think, uh, didn't ed tech companies make the mistake of uh, kind of overstepping the teacher, um, the learning guardian, as you call them, I love that phrase, um, because it was all about the kid, and it was really one-to-one, -one, as you said earlier. But I think there's an important part of the, of the whole classroom and the teacher's role in that and her access to data and her access to, you know, heads-up displays, if you will, of what's going on with each kid. Is, is that part of what you think it's is so important, future? David, and as we think about young learners and we think about the teachers who are prepared to shepherd their learning in grade school, they're generalists, right? They teach math, they teach reading, they teach recess. And we want them to help develop specific skills, mm -hmm. mastery skills in mathematics. Mm -hmm. So 
I think in that chapter one of ed tech, we went around the teacher. We decided that teachers were the problem. We decided teachers weren't worthy of investment. If we could just go around the teacher, then we would unleash learning and we would revolutionize learning. Mm -hmm. So I'm part of an industry that frankly has developed skepticism, mm -hmm. justified skepticism about education technology, about the promise of education technology. Mm -hmm. And so when something like Dreambox comes along, that actually is revolutionary, we try not to say that word, people kind of roll their eyes, heard it before, mm -hmm. been there, done that. Mm -hmm. So I think we've created a harder challenge for us for, for the V3 of learning technologies. And so what we did in the beginning was we brought nationally board certified teachers into the company. We took them out of the classroom, I have guilt about that, but we took them out of the classroom we sat them down next to our engineers, and we asked them to build something that they knew would work, something that they would be proud to use as educators. So it was built by teachers for teachers. It's not very sexy to say that your learning technology helps the learning guardian with actionable insights as well as the kid because we want to entertain as well as help learn. So there is that continuum of entertainment that's focused on education, edutainment, it's kind of light learning, and then serious learning that happens to be fun. And this is where I think the industry is going and where we can have the most impact, sustainable, scalable, uh, efficacious impact on learning. Yeah, and I think we've learned a lot from just watching how a teacher in the analog world teaches, you know, that she does know each child, she does try to personalize to every student, and she does need data, uh, you know, visual data and, and actual data to, to make decisions. We're in a, um, a city that has a lot of uh, large investments, large companies making big bets on machine learning and AI, um, things that are going to change our lives in, in pretty dramatic ways. How do you think? it will impact education, those technologies, and do you see a future for those technologies in the classroom? So this is something that weighs heavily on me, I have to confess. I, I think that right now, we're in a heady place for machine learning and AI, and we oftentimes spend most of our time talking about what we could do. And I think that spurs innovation. What might we do? What could we do? Mm -hmm. In learning, I think it's really important to try to shift that dialogue to, what we should do, from what we could do to why we should do it. And I think there are some technologies that I wonder about when I think about a little kid in kindergarten. Do I want to look at pupil dilation in a kindergartner? Mm -hmm. Manage the wave, I, brain waves. <laughs> I, th I think about that. And so I think that from my perspective, if we can focus AI and newer technologies on what we can do to enhance great, to support great teaching and learning. I think that's a win for kids, it's a win for learning guardians, it's a win for society. If we use technologies in a way where we don't know that they're going to achieve that, then I wonder why we're doing it. And so, for me, as I think about machine learning, I think about predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. If I can go to an educator at a district and tell them that there's a group of kids that are on track for year-end success, and there are a group of kids who are not on track for year-end success, then I think that's helpful because that educator can say, maybe I'll do different things right. for the second group than the first. Right. But with machine learning, if I can tell them with the group that's not on track for success, this is what you should do for Jesse, this is what you should do for David, and this is what you should do for Raul. Mm -hmm. And if you do that in the next four weeks, Jesse, David, and Raul will be on track mm -hmm. for your end success. That's what I mean by actionable insights. And because we collect so much data at Dreambox, so we delivered about 360 million lessons, math mm -hmm. lessons, mm -hmm. in the last academic mm -hmm. year. Think about that. That's at scale. trackable. Yeah. So we can study those data, and we can take a look at the trends, and we can say with very high confidence and fidelity, 
what my learning pathway is likely to be. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, what we want it to be, the gap between what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. So when I think about that use of machine learning, predictive analytics, mm -hmm. to help great teaching and learning, mm -hmm. I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. So there are some things that we could do that we might not. There are some mm -hmm. things that we should do that we will prioritize an investment. And you know, at some point, maybe the industry will consider adopting a Hippocratic Oath Mm -hmm. for learning. Mm -hmm. First, do no harm. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that frustrates people about K-12 is that it adopts technologies much later than the private sector. Right. Well, maybe there's an upside in that. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can make better, more informed decisions about what we should bring to learning by studying what, what happens well, in the private sector. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's the ecosystem that the learner is in. You know, mm -hmm. It goes all the way up to the district and the state. I'll never forget a state superintendent that I had a conversation with who said sort of about big data and data-driven decision-making, uh, because there's a lot. He said, yeah, we're data-rich, yeah. but we're insight-poor. Yeah. And until you can give that teacher the insights that she can act on, it's very difficult to use, make that person a data-driven decision maker. And I think that's a challenge in other industries as well. Um, I'm curious about whether or not what you've learned and what we've learned in ed tech has any applications to the big companies who are in the room here who are thinking about the graduates that are becoming employees who are not quite ready for um, the new technologies that are emerging. Um, we've focused in K-12 a lot on STEM learning because there's a need for graduates to have science, technology, education, and math backgrounds. What do you think companies should be doing with sort of, and, and universities should be doing for workforce readiness that maybe they could learn from what you do in elementary and middle schools? Well, we know a couple things. We know that most companies don't get candidates in a place where they can deploy them um, with a level of readiness that they would like. So increasingly, employers are spending more and more time on training mm -hmm. and development. Mm -hmm. Maybe they should. Mm -hmm. But what if we could um, identify what skills are present and what skills are lacking and customize that training more efficiently for the desired outcomes. So I think a lot of companies try to f use proxies for employee re readiness. Right. So we use schools, certain schools. We use degrees. Certain degrees are preferred. And we use experiences. And these are all proxies for what we think students can do, future right. employees can right. do. Right. At Dreambox, we literally give candidates problems, real problems, in the interview process. And we ask them to solve them. We ask them what they need to solve them, and they, they might say, I, I need to talk with somebody on the sales team, or I need to talk to somebody on the engineering team, so that they can formulate hypotheses about how to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. We get feedback from them, and then we let them go home, think about it, and then come back and tell us what their recommendation is. And mm -hmm. people say, why are you gonna do that? They could call their friends. <laughs> you don't know what they're capable of doing. Yeah. But if you think about it, yeah. if they're an employee for you, and they have a rich resource of people who know more than they, why isn't that a, a skill that we value? Right. It shows industriousness. It shows humility about what they know and what they don't know. And it shows tenacity about figuring out the answer even if they don't know it. And they're learners. And they're learners. Yeah, which is probably the most important point about the The most the important point. Yeah. And so even though we're using mathematics as the way to personalize learning, what we really think we're in the business of at Dreambox is teaching kids to learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. And if we can develop a generation of young people who can look at something unfamiliar, form a hypothesis, figure out what resources they need to solve it, and then come up with a reasonable approach, we're all gonna be better off. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have better algorithms, we're gonna have more engaged employees, and we're gonna have problem solvers that understand why it's so important and, and to have outcomes. that skill. Yeah, better, better outcomes. Better outcomes, that's exactly right. Um, you know, I've known you for a, a long time, a number of years, uh, Jesse, and I'm, I, I'm very impressed with you as a leader, not only in ed tech, but as a leader. I think you're a remarkable leader. Um, but you're also a woman and a person of color. 
And are we making progress or are we backsliding with regard to people like you achieving what you have achieved in your life? I get this question so much, and so I will, I will tell you what I normally say, which is I'm sitting here talking with you at a really important conference. Who's to say that we haven't made progress? Are there enough women? Are there enough people of color? No, but I'm here. So what do we do? What do we do to forward that progress? So I just read, many of you probably read, Jerry Brown's initiative in California that's going to mandate that there will be women on boards of every company headquartered in California. Woohoo! <laughs> women are excited about that. I'm excited <laughs> about that, right? So how do you get from aspiration to reality? So I was just having, we're, we're currently um, recruiting for a CFO, and I had a couple conversations with some recruiters. And I wanted to get a sense of what was in their pipeline, so they gave me a little sampling of the candidates, all extraordinary, all extraordinary candidates. And of the three folks that we were thinking about partnering with, two of them had extraordinary candidates, and all were men. And there were no people of color. They were all extraordinary. There was one, kind of boutique-y, didn't have the same cachet, and what they sent me was a sampling that had about 40% women and about 20% people of color. And I said, what did you do to recruit these people in your pipeline? Well, we had to work a little harder, we had to take a lot of channels, we did a little thing, we asked people like you to open up the Rolodex, and I thought, hmm. So I called back the other folks, I told them, you're not gonna get the business, but I wanna give you some insight about what the, the, the company that did get the business mm. did differently. So there are things that we can do to try to encourage people to diversify their channels. There are things that we can do to make sure that women and people of color are considered. Even if you don't necessarily say, I'm going to hire a woman, you wanna consider women, you wanna consider people of color. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to the day when people look at me and they don't see an anomaly. They don't see something special. Because here's the secret. There are people who are so much more talented <laughs> and have so much more promise than I do that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. So we need to, in our quest to unlock learning potential, we also have to unlock potential, human potential, mm -hmm. and bring more people to the table. Well, maybe technology can play a role in that as well. Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, finally, the, um, this is a first for GeekWire, I think, to have education technology talked about on this premier um, technology conference. Um, what do you think um, this audience should walk away from this session for in terms of the importance of education technology and how it might connect to some of what they might be thinking about? So I would say this, even though Dreambox is a learning technology company, our DNA is technology. We know that our future depends on our ability to attract the best minds and the best hearts to this work. And I, I fundamentally believe that if we can unlock the learning potential of every child, regardless of what zip code they live in, regardless of what language their parents speak, that's good for kids, but that's also good for families, it's good for communities. I would say it's the underpinning of a healthy democracy, and it's good for global, um, global, global peace. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm trying not to be too, um, I don't know, a big Profound. picture yeah. about this, but I really believe that. Wow. I think we, we are in an inflection point, and we've got to get this right. And what's different about where we are now is, uh, I think, three, three influences, if I may. The first is kids leave, lead technology-infused real lives. Mm -hmm. And they go to school, most of them, and they don't understand why we haven't updated their learning experience. They are literally waiting for Godot. <laughs> Secondly, parents know that even our best, the people who founded Dreambox Learning were people of means. They were people of means. And they knew that their kids in the best schools in Bellevue or wherever might not be good enough for global competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So parents know. 
that our best might not be good enough if we don't figure out a way to leverage technology. And thirdly, there is a new class of technologies that delivers personalization, engaged experiences with efficacious learning at scale, affordably. We have no excuse not to fix our education now because of those three influences. Well, I'm not surprised that the RISE Fund uh, invested in you. They are a social impact fund, and you're clearly making a social impact. Really, let's thank Jesse for <laughs> joining us this morning. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks. Thanks.